Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're, it, someone said, are we going to start any time soon? <laughs> and I know Dan Lundgren's voice when I hear it. <laughs> so let's begin. Uh, we're having a oversight hearing on sharing and analyzing information to prevent terrorism. And I'm privileged that this discussion could arise in the Judiciary Committee. The 9-11 attacks, the Fort Hood shootings, and the attempt to destroy Flight 253 headed uh, for Detroit this past Christmas all reveal limits of our government's ability to use information to stop terrorist attacks. These are long-standing issues that predate uh, both Obama and Bush administrations. And so today we have a valuable opportunity to explore what the government has done and what it is doing and what it needs to do to put these problems uh, in perspective and to keep everyone in this country as safe as possible. Now, it's no secret that the administration has faced a, seri a series of political criticisms in the wake of the attempted Christmas Day airplane bombing in Detroit because FBI agents gave Miranda warnings during their interrogation of the Flight 253 suspect. Uh, one of, of our uh, members in the other body called it irresponsible and dangerous. Another claims that there will be dire consequences. Now, in my view, these assertions ignore the reality. The suspect was first questioned without Miranda warnings and gave up important information. Some criticisms ignore the fact that the Miranda warnings were not given until after the suspect had stopped talking of his own accord. Some ignore the fact that the suspect has continued to cooperate and provide valuable information after receiving the Miranda warnings. Uh, they ignore the fact that under the prior administration, Miranda warnings were read to the so-called shoe bomber Richard Reed on four separate occasions. According to reports, the first warning was given five minutes after he was taken into custody. The same is the case with many complaints we hear now about trying terror cases in federal court. Uh, some ignore the fact that the prior administration tried numerous terrorism cases in federal court without major incident and pretty good success. It is also notable that in recent, in the recent conviction in the federal court of David Coleman Headley for his role in the Mumbai hot hotel attacks, Headley reportedly re provided extensive intelligence after being charged and is now serving a life sentence. There's no issue that we face as a nation that is more challenging than getting the balance right on terrorism. While none of us can predict the future, I can tell you our constitutional system of checks and balance, uh, balances has served uh, our nation well for more than 230 years and uh, has been a model for many nations around the world. Matter of fact, some of us have gone to the countries that were trying to emulate our constitutional and, and democratic system of government. Now, if we follow that model, I believe we can and will defeat terrorists and protect our citizens' liberties. 
Uh, I suppose that's for my purposes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the purpose of the hearing. How do we protect our citizens and still keep our liberties? And so in that spirit, I've uh, some questions that I hope uh, the distinguished national security professionals here today will address. In early January, the president issued a series of written directives to the executive branch agencies involved in national security. He described uh, this memo as corrective additions and demanded monthly progress reports on their implementation. I hope uh, some of our witnesses can update us as well on the progress of these correction, corrective actions. Second, it seems that one of the biggest intelligence challenges we face is learning to deal with the larger and larger volumes of information that we collect and developing methods to separate the wheat from the chaff. Do you think there's a point at which we are collecting so much information that we're actually making it harder to identify and separate out the action that really matters? Is there such a thing as collecting too much information? And finally, we've become uh, very expert here in figuring out what went wrong in a particular instance and fixing those gaps. But I think we have a broader view here. Uh, after 9-11, we improved our information sharing. And now after Flight 253, we will have, a, we will have new analysis teams and better systems to search our databases. I'd like to know what you as our experts and guests here this morning are doing beyond uh, this fighting the last war kind of mentality. Uh, what are we doing now to identify other possible gaps that may be existing in our security systems? And so I, I welcome you here this morning, and I'd like to <coughs> yield to my friend Lamar Smith of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Omar Farouk Abdul Matalab attempted to blow up Northwest Flight 253 on its way to Detroit on Christmas Day. Thankfully, his attempt was thwarted and hundreds of innocent lives were spared. After failing in his attempt to murder 288 innocent Americans, Abdul Muttalib was questioned for less than an hour and then given the right to remain silent. He then stopped talking to investigators for the next four weeks. The administration brushes off criticism about his decision to Mirandize Abdul Muttalib because he has since provided useful intelligence to investigators. But what vital intelligence was missed because of his four weeks of silence? Was a plea bargain for a reduced sentence necessary to get more information? And what questions did his lawyers refuse to let him answer? At the very least, Abdul Muttalib's month of silence gave his co-conspirators time to cover their tracks. So the Obama administration forfeited an opportunity to obtain information that might have identified terrorists and prevented future attacks. That neither the president nor his national security advisors supported treating Abdul Muttalib as an enemy combatant is worrisome. As the president has admitted, under his new policies, the CIA has, quote, a harder job, end quote. The president's policies make it easier for terrorists to get constitutional rights and harder for intelligence officials to keep America safe. Abdul Muttalib should never have been allowed to board the plane to Detroit. Despite warnings from Abdul Muttalib's father about his son's possible Muslim radi radicalization, the U.S. visa he had been issued in 2008 was neither identified nor revoked. 
mr chairman i want to call a piece of legislation to your attention because it goes to the future as you just were suggesting a minute ago earlier this month i introduced legislation designated to help make the visa process more secure h r forty seven fifty eight the secure visas act requires placement of visa security units at u s consular post in high risk countries such as algeria lebanon and syria the placement of visa security units at u s consular post will help address lapses in the current system and prevent terrorists from gaining access to the united states h r forty seven fifty eight explicitly grants the department of homeland security secretary the authority to revoke a visa and to delegate that authority to others in the agency these are common sense steps to help ensure that no one who wants to do us harm is able to enter and stay in the united states the president says that we are at war with terrorist groups but many of the administration's decisions have actually put the american people at greater risk first trying to close a terrorist detention facility at guantanamo bay has not made america safer the pentagon has reported that twenty percent of released get mo terrorists have returned to plotting attacks against americans two former get mo detainees in yemen are suspected of organizing the christmas day plot second the administration's decision to try terrorists in federal civilian court continues the trend of weakening national security bringing terrorists into the criminal justice system limits our ability to interrogate them and get intelligence that might prevent attacks and save lives abdul matalib didn't simply rob a convenience store he tried to blow up a plane and kill nearly three hundred innocent civilians this was an act of war and should be treated as such the american people agree sixty seven percent of americans favor military tribunals to try terrorist suspects and third the obama administration released highly sensitive memos detailing interrogation tactics used against terrorists the formerly classified office of legal counsel memos gave terrorists a how to manual on how to resist interrogation tactics these are just a few of the ways the administration has weakened our national security richard cohen a very liberal columnist recently wrote in the washington post that quote there is almost nothing the Obama administration does regarding regarding terrorism that makes me feel safer in quote last month national security officials warned that another terrorist attack is certain within the next three to six months but we don't need national security officials to predict attacks we need them to prevent attacks that means we need to apprehend and interrogate terrorists Many believe that the war on terror is over and that the threat from Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups is nothing more than a vague memory from nine years ago. The Christmas Day bombing attempt is proof that the war on terror continues and that radical jihadists are as committed as ever to killing Americans. The administration must be equally committed to stopping them. The time for complacency is over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thanks, Lamar. I now re recognize uh, Dan Lundgren, the senior former attorney general of the largest state in the union. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I understand how serious uh, the issues are that are before us today. Uh, I respect the professionals that are here before us. But I would le be less than honest if I did not say that I have profound differences with the approach this administration has taken in a number of different areas. I understand the importance of things such as the Miranda warnings. I recall when I had the opportunity to personally argue a case before the U.S. Supreme Court on an essential concept. What is the constitutional definition <coughs> of reasonable doubt given to juries in criminal cases? seemingly an elementary question, but one that uh, caused the court to uh, grant a case consideration from two states of the union, my state being one of them. At the same time, I've always uh, understood the distinction between a criminal justice matter and a matter of national security, and particularly a matter of national security based on a terrorist threat. And what we have to do is somehow deal with that area where they come into um, contact. 
And the question, therefore, is a serious one, whether it is appropriate for us to take those concepts, some th would say that are bedrock in our criminal justice system, and somehow place them over into the national security arena, particularly in the area of terrorism. The 9-11 Commission told us that one of the worst, that one of the major criticisms of our actions before 9-11 was our failure to connect the dots. And there were those that uh, suggested that part of that was our confusion in <coughs> that uh, area of nexus between the criminal justice system and the um, national security system. And responding to that, we attempted to make changes. I don't know anybody who believes what we did uh, <coughs> in responding to the threat during the Christmas period by this particular uh, bomber. Anybody thinks it was sufficient. Uh, Mr. Leitner has told us that um, Mr. Abdul Matalab should not have stepped on the plane. The counterterrorism system failed, and I told the president we are ter determined to do better. So our question is, how do we do better? And one of the areas I would, uh, I guess, uh, directly disagree with the chairman, with all due respect, is the idea that somehow Mirandizing people makes it more likely that they're going to speak to us than if they're not Mirandized, almost as if there's some psychological um, impact on people that once we grant them their Miranda rights, they feel obligated to tell us something. Uh, in fact, in law enforcement circles, while we know we are required to do Mirandizing, we recognize that oftentimes that interferes with our ability to gain useful information, but we believe that is acceptable under our Constitution. But I would suggest that we are in dangerous territory if we blithely transfer the same concept of Miranda warnings that the Supreme Court has uh, put forward into the area of suspected terrorists. One of the things that uh, bothers me, and I think bothers everybody, is why did we not connect the dots here, the information that was there, a father that comes to a, an American entity and says, I suspect my son uh, may have fallen under the, um, under the influence of terrorist groups in Yemen. Somehow that doesn't get through the system, and we're, I know we're going to hear some in detail on that. But in response to that, I have been informed that while the previous administration <clears throat> instructed the government to identify and collect information on individuals quote-unquote appropriately suspected or quote-unquote reasonably suspected of terrorist connections or for whom there was a quote articulable and reasonable basis for suspicion that we now have adopted a new standard that says this to meet the reasonable suspicion standard the nominator based on the totality of circumstances must rely on articulable intelligence or information which, taken together with rational inferences from those facts, reasonably warrant a determination that an individual is known or suspected to be or have been knowingly engaged in conduct constituting in preparation for, in aid of, or related to terrorism or terrorist activities. And I will inquire of the four of you how you believe that that gets us where we need to go, that somehow that makes it more rational, and somehow with that standard, that is going to get the information flow unclogged as it was clogged in the case that we're talking about. I would argue that that kind of legalistic, almost CYA language is going to make it more difficult. And if I'm the person involved in the system and I'm told that's the standard to which I will be held, and if I fail that standard, I will be disciplined or perhaps punished, how that is going to encourage people in the intelligence community to do the kind of creative thinking and thinking out of the box that's necessary to protect this country so that we don't come here after another incident that may be successful and say, you know, we created a wall that we didn't intend to create that somehow mandated that our people were not created 
in their thinking and did not think out of the box, and therefore, because the bad guys thought out of the box, we have lost lives. I thank the chairman for the time. Thank you very much. I, I now turn to Daryl Issa, <coughs> who is not only the ranking member on government reform, but served with distinction on the Intelligence Committee itself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to associate myself in a broad sense with all of you. I think today's hearing for all of us who serve on this committee and other committees is the beginning of a process of reevaluating the work we've done over the last nine years. I'm personally a civil libertarian, as the chairman knows. I very much believe that, uh, <coughs> that Miranda is an important right of individuals against self-incrimination. However, when we choose areas of specific protection, not the battlefield where, as, a, as an Army lieutenant, I was never given a, uh, a copy of Miranda to read to somebody that if I were so fortunate as to uh, find them on the battlefield. Those are, those are opportunities in which investigations begin well afterwards. But our domestic ports of entry are by definition controlled environments in which the scenario and the plan of what to do if someone is found entering or exiting with a plan to bomb or in some other way commit a terrorist act is a scenario we can plan and predict. There's no question that the FBI should have known what they were going to do if a man with explosives in his pants was found and whether or not the best course of action was to Mirandize him, as Mr. Lundgren said, in the hopes that that somehow would cause him to tell us more, or not Mirandize him because ultimately they had what they needed in order to effectively prosecute him for one or more crimes, while at the same time they had no idea who the other terrorist uh, conspirators could be. I think that's a point that government oversight and reform will continue to look at. The question of in controlled space, do we really have the scenarios? Are they well thought out and are they leading to the best outcome from a prosecution standpoint when appropriate, but clearly from a standpoint of safety of American travelers and the American people overall? On that, I believe we can all agree there was a failure. Additionally, I happen to be an Arab American, and so I want to associate myself broadly with the fact that Arab Americans have been the victims of a loss of civil liberty. Those who are innocent Americans, including my poor non-Arab wife, who just happens to be cursed with the last name Isa, Arabic for Jesus, finds herself on a no-fly list. I'm equally concerned that the no-fly list can f somehow get Catherine Issa onto it and have to be taken off. Well, somebody whose own father says he's going to try to commit a crime, he's a, he's a terrorist, he's an extremist, don't let him in, somehow does not rise to the level in any one of the many cables alone, nor are the cables connected in a way that will lead to that outcome. I'm deeply concerned because I have been reluctantly supporting legislation that often goes beyond my comfort level, including the Patriot, some elements of the Patriot Act, and yet we don't seem to have gotten what we were promised. Again, beyond the scope of just this committee, but well within the scope of all of us as people who swore allegiance to the Constitution. Last, as the Chairman was so kind to mention, in my service on the Select Intelligence Committee and now my uh, uh, membership as the Ranking <coughs> Member of Government Oversight, we have invested countless hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in creating databases that can, in fact, serve us to prevent stove piping. The excuse that the dots were not connected this time is a self-inflicted wound not created by money not, or not prevented by lack of money and certainly not by lack of a directive from all of us on the dais and all of the uh, people in the last administration that we connect the dots. I don't think it's a secret by any means that our intelligence community can take disparate information, pieces and bits of words, put them together, and with analysis, sometimes automated, sometimes by talented human beings, reach a conclusion that there is a threat. We do that when we look outward. Today, it, with the indulgence of the chairman, I'm going to also task the individuals here to explain to us in a 
at an open session why we don't turn that same analysis in word so that disparate cable as we're being told each one not being sufficient to to cause a triggering of the no fly list we're not connected by some sort of software which we certainly have paid for we certainly own and we certainly believe failed us on christmas day this chairman i thank you for your indulgence and yield back thank you darrell i now recognize steve king of iowa who serves in addition to our committee on small business and agriculture as well thank you mr chairman i appreciate this hearing and the witnesses coming before this panel today and as i listen to the opening statements of yours and um, ranking member smith and others that have discussed this issue it, it comes back to me that um, we had a shoe bomber and uh, that's that happened years ago that was the heads up for something like this and when we uh, we set up our security system the department of homeland security and uh, all of the pieces of federal legislation that put the tools in place uh, so that we could prevent terrorists from hijacking airplanes set up the filters as much as we could um, this is one of the things that we had in mind I mean it isn't it isn't a new tactic it was a tactic that had already been used uh, when this uh, when, when the these parameters were set up when the uh, when the people that are in charge in the departments are thinking about what could happen bad to the United States, this had to be a model of no more shoe bombers. I mean, I've taken my shoes off so many times, I know that's the model. Uh, and yet, the dots weren't connected. And I can understand why, um, why the device itself wasn't discovered. And that is a problem. Uh, that's, that's a serious problem on how we would actually be able to identify individuals getting on airplanes that might have devices like that. So our heads up uh, that is back through the visa program and the visa security program. And uh, when I think about the, the one reason that was given, one of several, that there was uh, the, the exact spelling of his name didn't exactly match up, so therefore they believed that there wasn't a visa that had been issued to, uh, I always have to look that up, Abdul Farouk. Uh, I've got Abdul Farouk Abdul Muttalib. And uh, it takes a little practice, but I have to go back and I look at that, and I, and I think, all right, that's understandable if you're matching up paper records or if you're putting, uh, putting a name in quotes and sending it off in a software search. But when I do that on a Google page, it comes up and it says, well, didn't you mean? And it will give me an alternative, alternative spelling. But one of the things I'm going to be interested in is now do we have at least a Google software so we could resolve that problem? And uh, I'm also interested in how it was that his father himself, who said, I'm, my son has disappeared, and I believe that he's gone over to the other side and been radicalized, uh, that should have been powerful enough for there to be individual attention to follow it. And the third thing would be he was a high-ranking Nigerian official who had credibility. It wasn't just someone off the street, uh, and it wasn't just a lineup of many cases. This was a case that uh, should have had a red flag on it in several different ways. And then I'm also interested in the difference in the philosophy of how we're going to go forward and fight this global war on terror. Um, the philosophy of uh, it's a law enforcement action. It's been clear that this administration has put down marker after marker after marker that they believe it's law enforcement and not a war. And uh, I contemplate what we do when we have terrorists that fit a whole series of different kind of definitions. Um, you could have a terrorist that was born, raised, bred, and trained and committed or attempted to commit an act against American interests in a foreign country and never set foot in the United States. Um, you could go clear to the other side, a born, raised, bred, and trained American terrorist who never set foot outside the United States but still was radicalized and still was part of that same network. And I think I could give you about six other definitions that fit in between those two extremes. Uh, yet they're all part of the same, the same movement that is attacking the United States. And, and, I, and we can't do this as a, just a law enforcement endeavor. And we can't have terrorists that are committing similar acts that fit different categories of terrorism that go into a different kind of different system in our justice. We've got to look at this as a, as a war. And we've got to put the enemies we're fighting in the same category. So I'm going to suggest that as we go through this discussion today, uh, we consider an idea that I generated some months ago. And that's the, uh, the idea of establishing uh, a new set of laws 
for our for our terrorists and to to adjudicate them immediately as a terrorist and not read them their miranda rights and let them be subjected to the amount of interrogation necessary to protect the american people try them all in a military court get them all off the u s soil and out of the hands of our federal judges as quickly as we can so that we can effectively fight this war that's the parameters that i review this as i listen to this discussion i'm looking forward to the testimony of the witnesses mr chairman i appreciate your indulgence and i yield back the balance of my time thank you steve i now turn to judge ted poll of texas he serves on foreign affairs and on both the crime and immigration subcommittees thank you mr chairman with all of the u s resources and money and intelligence and information our security system in this incident boiled down to the fact that we had to rely on an individual from the netherlands who saw the underwear bomber doing something he shouldn't be doing like setting his pants on fire and jump across several other people on an airplane to tackle him and then with the aid of other passengers he was subdued but for that person from the netherlands i believe we would have had a tragedy uh, i don't think that's a good security system that we have to rely on passengers to be our hope or defense of uh, preventing airplanes from being blown up uh, everybody wants to say somebody else is at fault but the bottom line is there is information available and it wasn't used we have a watch list we have a no-fly list and it seems like those are just lists that don't do anything except keep certain people from not flying in the watch list with the thousands and thousands of other people I guess we're just watching those folks uh, I think we need to do some obvious things, and that is get our house in order and secure the system so that we keep outlaws from getting on our airplanes. And it starts all the way back to the embassy that gets information from daddy that this guy is a threat to the United States. Uh, a lot of people fail down on their jobs, but someday somebody's going to die because people don't share information and pass information on uh, so I think excuses there are there are no excuses for why uh, the system fails we cannot let it fail uh, otherwise uh, we'll have tragedy and maybe we need to rethink some of the ways that we um, talk to folks who show up at airports I think the Israelis have set up a model that uh, has been quite successful for their nation. In any event, we ought to at least talk to them about how they are able to be so successful, and maybe we should adopt their procedures uh, in some of our airports. But uh, uh, the American people deserve better. Uh, they deserve better from a nation that is supposed to be the world's superpower, and they deserve better than to expect that some passenger from the Netherlands is going to save us all from disaster. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Tim Rooney, did you have a comment? The gentleman from Florida is recognized. If you thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's Tom Rooney, but that's okay. I'm, I'm a new guy. Mr. Chairman, uh, it's been almost nine years since the attacks of September 11, 2001. And I clearly remember in the days following the attacks of 9-11, uh, we committed as a nation to never allow such a failure of intelligence ever to happen again. I clearly remember the uh, formulation and the, the, the makeup of why and, and what Homeland Security was going to be, that we would never have a communications breakdown again between agencies of the federal government so that uh, Americans could feel safer that the communications between the, the various agencies would be more fluid. Uh, I wasn't sure how creating a new agency was going to do that, but of course had the confidence in our government to be able to uh, figure that out for me as a regular constituent at that time and, and, and to keep us safe. Um, 
and we have, as the chairman said, over the last nine years uh, been kept safe. But in the last year, there's been some serious flags uh, that have been raised, as you've heard in, in the various opening statements so far. Uh, Fort Hood, Texas, where I was formerly stationed, uh, we, we came to know a guy named Major Nadal Hassan, who we've since come to know as a captain, was a very substandard Army officer um, who was communicating with people that should have raised red flags. We've also come to know that these communications, separate from his officer evaluation reports, uh, were known by people in the intelligence agency and may or may not have been shared with the Department of Defense or the Department of Army. And my immediate question after that is how after 9-11, with Homeland Security and everything that we talked about, that these agencies would communicate better, how does intelligence agency not communicate with the Department of Defense and say one of your own is talking with people, uh, Aliki, who has been in communications with 9-11 pilots, uh, and as we'll, we'll come to see, Abdu Matalam himself. Then we see, of course, what we're here today to talk about, and that's the uh, communications failures leading up to the, the attack on Christmas. Um, the President said that after, after, this, uh, after this attempt by the so-called underwear bomber that there was a mix of human and system failures that contributed to this potential catastrophic breach of security. I kind of disagree with that. I, I think that the, it was not potential catastrophic. I think it was catastrophic when it comes to you and your jobs. I think that there, ca there can be nothing more discomforting to the American people to know that over the last year uh, we've had these two breaches of security, and I think that they are catastrophic. And hopefully that's one of the things that we can um, uh, try to figure out here today. But my questions are, where is the disconnect We've heard before by other opening statements, where are the dots not connected? And I'll have a chart to discuss with you later during Q&A, but when and where are we allowed to do and not to do for the sake of national security? What are we allowed to do? And that, that goes with, as we said, Miranda, what constitutional protections come to these people? And then juxtapose that to what the American people expect of us. I've, I've seen the databases, I've seen the the uh, Visa Viper, the TIE, the Selectee, the no-fly list, who qualifies, who doesn't qualify, what standard of proof is needed to put somebody on these lists. It's very confusing. Um, and uh, it seems like a lot of people have their fingers in this game. And I'm, I'm again, I'm just not sure that that was the purpose after 9-11, the sale that was made to the American people that you would be kept safe by a more streamlined system. It doesn't seem that way to me. Um, as Wes was said, I'm also just uh, very concerned about the fact that Abdu Matalb's name was misspelled and that somehow bounced him out of collection or, uh, th these databases as, as somebody to keep an eye on. Um, reports that the NSA reportedly intercepted communications between Aliki and Abdu Matalb. Um, again, where, where were the dots there? Uh, even if the intelligence officer officials didn't know his full name, how much did they know? What, what about his dad, a, a doctor in Yemen, uh, who Petraeus said to us on the Armed Services Committee just last year that Yemen is a place we need to seriously look at? And uh, a, a, a doctor, and I, and I imagine the people in, Ye in Yemen aren't very friendly to the people of the United States. So if a guy goes to the U.S. Embassy and, and is a doctor and he makes a complaint about his son wanting to blow up, he's taking some risk there, I would imagine, so it probably should be taken seriously. And I don't mean to disparage our intelligence community or anybody on this panel. I understand you guys have a very difficult job. I understand that you're trying to do that job, uh, and, it's, and it's not easy. But we have an obligation, as you know, to the American pe people so that another Christmas Day or another uh, Nadal Hassan uh, does not happen. So being nine years after 9-11, uh, I personally, as many members on this panel, would love to know how the dots are connected and whether or not it's streamlined enough, and if we can and should make it better. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Tom. I should have mentioned that you were a, also a military prosecutor in your uh, other career. I was actually good at that job, sir. 
Thank you for mentioning it. You underestimate how highly we think of you here in the 111th Congress. I can feel it. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bill Delahunt. Oh, he's not here. Uh, Bob Goodlatte, have you a comment? Well, we want to welcome uh, all of our witnesses here today. Uh, Patrick Kennedy, Patricia Cogswell, Timothy Healer, Healy. We'll start with uh, Russ Travers, Deputy Director for Information Sharing and Knowledge Development for National Counter Counterterrorism Center. Uh, he's been in the job since 2003 and is in charge of Tide Terrorism Database. Uh, and prior to that, he worked uh, in the Defense Intelligence Agency and Army Intelligence uh, for 25 years. All of your statements will be included in the record, and we welcome your testimony. Senator Conyers, Congressman Smith, members of the committee, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Pull your mic up closer. Uh, my written statement is going to detail NCTC's role in support of watch listing and specifically focuses on the attempted attack on Christmas Day. At your staff's request, I'm going to expand on that statement and use my opening remarks to address the somewhat broader context that a number of you have addressed in your, in your statements. Sir, a little louder? I'll begin by distinguishing 1225 issues from those of 9-11, and then I'm going to talk specifically about what NCTC has been doing since Christmas. First, the issues raised by 1225 were not in any way like those of 9-11. It was not a, a failure to share information. The key pieces of intelligence related to 1225 were broadly available across the intelligence community, and that's important. Why? Because it highlights the fact that simply sharing information does not guarantee accurate intelligence analysis. In that sense, information sharing is necessary, but it's certainly not sufficient. I would also note, as a number of you have mentioned, information sharing has expanded dramatically since 9-11. There are difficult legal policy privacy issues that do remain. I'd be happy to talk about those in the Q&A if you'd like. 1225 was also not, uh, did not call into question the basic watch listing architecture that's existed since 2003. It is complicated. I absolutely agree with that. I think that's necessary, though. That architecture that was designed in 2003 was intended to ensure that all screeners had the benefit of any information collected by any collector in the United States government. That was very different than it was before 9-11. And in that regard, I think we've succeeded. In that regard, I think, again, we've enhanced information sharing. It is certainly not perfect. It is a names-based system. And 1225 highlighted a number of themes that my colleagues and I will discuss. For instance, standards as to who gets on a watch list. We could lower that bar. If we do so, it has significant balance issues. How big do you want the list to get? And what are the associated trade-offs? Long lines, false positives, and so forth. And we're working through, th through those balance issues. So what did fail on Christmas Day? And here, I think the bumper sticker description is that we failed to, quote unquote, connect the dots. But what does that actually mean? Personally, I do not believe it's a good metaphor. It conjures up the notion of the, uh, the puzzle that our preschool kids use. You got a sea of dots. They're numbered from 1 to 29. You follow the line, and you get a duck. Or in our case, you get a terrorist plot. Intelligence has never worked that way, and it never will. You do have a sea of dots. They aren't numbered. Lots of them are wrong. Many others are ambiguous or contradictory, and still others are just innocuous. You just don't know a priori which ones are important. And that was the problem with 1225. Father comes into the embassy in Abuja. His son is involved with extremists in Yemen, as a number of you have noted. That, given the standards of the time, doesn't come close to getting him watch listed. It does put him on the screen. It does not get him watch listed. There was one other piece of information that was out there. It was in the noise. On a daily basis, the terrorism intelligence traffic includes something like 10,000 names every day. In this case, we had a partial name, no last name, differently spelled than the name that we got from the father. 
and that's where we failed we did not connect those two pieces of information and that's what we're working very hard to do better in the future the question i think is how do we do a better job of exploiting the information that is down in the noise is all of that background information in the sea of data that we confront conceptually if you envision that sea of dots what we're trying to do is lower the bar so there is less information that we are not able to exploit given the resource and time constraints under which we operate. Let me give you three initiatives that we're focused on at NCTC. First, at Presidential Directive, we're establishing a record enhancement capability for our terrorist identities database. And that, in effect, is improving our ability to build a fuller dossier on individuals that are nominated to the National Counterterrorism Center. Secondly, NCTC has also uh, fenced off about 40 individuals into what we call pursuit teams. And these individuals have been relieved of writing intelligence analysis. What they're doing is focusing on data points of potential interest, and they're charged with following them through until we resolve. Is this an important piece of information or is it not? And third, we're continuing to focus on the basic data access, technical infrastructure, and tools that are necessary to help find what we call unknown unknowns. In effect, to help us find linkages between dots when we just don't know a priori that there's any linkage there. Very complicated problem. In sum, Mr. Chairman, NCTC has been very working very closely with all of our interagency partners to try to rectify the problems identified by 1225. And certainly, I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Timothy Healy is the director of the Terrorist Screening Center at the FBI. And that group is responsible for the maintenance of terrorist match <coughs> watch lists, including the no-fly list. He's been with the FBI for 25 years and helped create uh, the Terrorist Screening Center. Uh, he's received the Director's Award for outstanding work uh, in his responsibilities. We welcome you here this morning. Chairman Conyers, Ranking Member Smith, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the Terror Screening Center and its role in the interagency watchlisting process. The attempted terrorist attack on Northwest Flight 253, 253 on Christmas Day highlights the ever-present threat that to our homeland. Over the past seven years, the TSC has played a vital role in this fight against terrorism by integrating the terrorist information from the law enforcement and intelligence communities into a single database known as the Terror Screening Center Database, the TSDB, or the Terrorist Watch List. Following Christmas Day, the attempted attack provided an increased intensive scrutiny that has been placed on the requirements to nominate individuals to the watch list, particularly the no-fly and the selectee list which are subsets of the TSDB. These requirements or standards have evolved over time based on the experience of the watchlisting community and the issuance of additional presidential directives. Throughout this process, the TSC is, has remained committed to protecting the American people while simultaneously protecting privacy and safeguarding civil liberties. As our efforts have evolved in response to the new threats and intelligence, your support has been vital. Let me tell you about the watchlisting process, but understand the Terrorist Screening Center the watchlisting process is half of it. We work the, the watchlisting process to get names out to the screeners. We also, when we encounter the terrorists, we also coordinate the operational response with the FBI. But with regard to the watchlisting process, it's best described as a watchlisting enterprise that requires a collaboration between the intelligence community, the FBI, NCTC, and TSC. The NCTC relies upon information provided by the intelligence and law enforcement community the TSC relies upon information that NCTC provides us where they analyze and provide accurate and credible information, and the screening community relies on the TSC to manage the information and efficiently export it to their screening systems. Once a known or suspected terrorist has been identified and included in the TSDB, the TSC ensures the timely dissemination of that terrorist identity data to our screening partners. The utility of the watch listing process is greatest when the information is efficiently disseminated to those who could use it most. TSC has subject matter experts who are composed of experienced analysts and from designated rep agency representatives 
who we re review nominations to determine if they meet the criteria for inclusion into the screening system. Four major U.S. government systems support the TSD. The Departments of State, Counselor Lookout, and Support Systems are classed, and that's for passports and visa screening. Department of Homeland Security Tech System for border and port, port entry screening. The No-Fly Selectee List used by the Transportation Security Administration for air passenger screening. And the FBI's National Crime Information Center of known or suspected terrorist file for domestic law enforcement encounters. The criteria for inclusion into each one of these systems is tailored to its mission, its legal authorities, its information technology requirements for each particular agency. Before Christmas Day, the TSD had not received the nomination for Umar Farouk Abu Mutalab, and as a result, he was not watch listed. Following the attempted attack, the President issued a directive for the TSD to review all facts surrounding this incident. As a, as a result, the TSD was given two basic instructions. The first was to conduct a thorough review of the TSDB to determine the current visa status of all known or suspected terrorists, beginning with the no-fly list. That process has been complete. The second was to develop recommendations on whether adjustments are needed to the watch listing nomination criteria, including the biographical and derogatory information for inclusion into TIED and to TSDB, as well as the no-fly and select D list. To do so, the TSC convened the policy, the policy Board Working Group with representatives from the National Carnegie Ter Terrorism Center, the Central Intelligence Agency, the National Security Agency, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, Department of Justice, and Department of State to achieve this interagency consensus. That process is underway and TSC is working with our interagency partners to develop appropriate recommendations to the, to the White House. Also at the direction of the White House in, and in conjunction with NCTC, the TSC has made some temporary and limited additions to the watch list to counter the specific threat that was observed on Christmas Day. As a result, a threat-related target group was identified and individuals from specific high-threat countries already residing in TIDE and TSDB were either upgraded, added to the no-fly or selectee list, and this was to prevent future attacks. The TSC remains focused on fulfilling its presidential mandates and interagency mandates to share terrorist screening information with our domestic and foreign partners. We have a standing commitment to improve our operational processes, to enhance our human capital and technological capabilities, and, continu and to continue to protect the Americans from terrorist threats while protecting privacy and safeguarding civil liberties. The terrorism watching, watch listing system is a vital tool in the counterterrorism effort of the United States government and continues to be. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Our next witness is Patricia Cogswell, a lawyer who is acting deputy assistant secretary for the Office of Policy at the Department of Homeland Security. Most of her career has been spent at the Department of Homeland Security and the INS before that, and has served as executive director of the uh, Department of Homeland Security screening. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Conyers, Congressman Smith, and members of the committee. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify on sharing and analyzing of information to prevent terrorism. DHS has a number of screening programs in place and works closely with foreign governments and air carriers in our efforts to strengthen global aviation security. Information sharing and analysis plays a critical role in these programs. This administration and all of us here today are determined to find and fix the vulnerabilities that allowed Umar Farouk Abdulmutallab to board a U.S. bound plane and prevent such breaches in the future. Today I will describe the screening conducted in the aviation environment including the changes DHS has put in place since December 25th and how we are moving forward to further bolster aviation security. First, most non-citizens need a visa or if traveling under the Visa Waiver Program, a travel authorization issued through the DHS Electronic System for Travel Authorization, or ESTA, prior to travel to the United States. DHS screens each ESTA applicant to assess whether he or she could pose a risk to the United States, including potential links to terrorism. At certain embassies and consulates, DHS has also placed visa security program personnel to assist State Department in identifying visa applicants who may pose a security concern. DHS 
also conducts pre-departure screening in partnership with the airline industry. Individuals on the no-fly list should not receive a boarding pass. Individuals on the select D list must go through additional physical screening before boarding an aircraft. Through the implementation of the Secure Flight Program, which is underway now, DHS is checking passenger manifests against these lists directly, a job previously performed by the air carriers. For international travel, carriers are also required to provide DHS with access to certain passenger reservation information, basic identifying and itinerary information, referred to as passenger name record, 72 hours prior to departure to the U.S. Carriers must then transmit their flight manifest containing complete and standardized information on the traveler as shown on their official travel document through the advanced passenger information system no less than 30 minutes before the flight. DHS uses both of these data feeds to be able to do risk assessments and conduct checks against the known or suspected terrorist watch list, lost or stolen passport information, prior immigration or customs violations, visa revocations, and as other records such as State Department records indicating a potential terrorism concern. If the flight departs from an airport where DHS has an immigration advisory program officer stationed, the IAP officers make use of this information to interact with individuals and can make no board recommendations to the carriers or host governments. In non-AAP locations, DHS will directly contact the airline when appropriate to recommend a person not board a flight. This is a change since December 25th. The next step in the process is the physical screening of passengers, their accessible property, their checked baggage by utilizing a combination of x-ray systems, walk-through metal detectors, full body pat-downs, explosive trace detection equipment, trained canines, advanced imaging technology, and behavioral detection, depending on the location. In the U.S., DHS conducts that screening. Overseas, the screening is conducted by the foreign government, the air carriers, or their respected airport authority. Since the 25th, DHS has put in place security directives and emergency amendments for increased use of enhanced screening technologies and threat-based and random screening uh, procedures. These measures have been implemented with the extraordinary cooperation from our global aviation partners. DHS also conducts security assessments in accordance with standards set by the International Civil Aviation Organization at approximately 300 foreign airports. If an airport does not meet these standards, DHS works with the appropriate host government authorities to raise the airport's security posture. In addition to all these immediate activities we've already taken to secure, to further enhance our processes, we are also taking action to address the systemic vulnerabilities highlighted by this failed attack. As announced by the President and Secretary Napolitano as part of the overall U.S. government approach, DHS is using, pursuing five objectives to enhance the protection of air travel from acts of terrorism. These include working with our interagency partners to reevaluate and modify the criteria and process used to create the terrorist watch list, establishing a partnership on aviation security with the Department of Energy and its national labs to develop future technologies that deter and disrupt threats, accelerating the deployment of advanced imaging technology as well as increasing our use of explosive trained canines and ex uh, explosive detection equipment augmenting law enforcement in aviation, and working with our partners to strengthen international security measures and standards for aviation security. While we address the vulnerabilities associated with the December 25th attempted bombing, we must also recognize the evolving threats posed by terrorists and take swift and appropriate action to ensure that our layers of security continue to evolve in order to defeat them. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Patrick Kennedy, Undersecretary for Management at the Department of State, has been a career foreign service officer for more than 30 years, and in addition to other responsibilities, uh, heads the Bureau of Consular Affairs, which issues visas overseas. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chairman Connors, Ranking Member Smith, distinguished members of the committee. After the attempted bombing of Flight 253, Secretary Clinton stated that we are all looking hard at what did happen in order to improve our procedures, to avoid human errors, mistakes, oversights of any kind, and we're going to be working hard with the rest of the administration to improve every aspect of our efforts. This introspective review and the concurrent interagency review are ongoing, 
we appreciate this committee's interest and support as we continue the review process we recognize fully the gravity we face and we consider ourselves the first line of defense in our national security efforts we acknowledge that processes need to be improved and here are the steps we have already taken the department of state misspelled Umar Farouk Abdulmutallab's name in our Visa Vipers report. As a result, we did not add the information about his current U.S. visa. To prevent this from occurring again, we have instituted new procedures to ensure comprehensive visa information is included in all Visa Viper reporting. This will highlight the visa application and issuance material also available in the data already shared with our national security partners. We are also reevaluating the procedures and criteria used to revoke visas. The State Department has broad and flexible authority in this matter. Since 2001, we have revoked 57,000 visas for a variety of reasons, including over 2,800 for suspected links to terrorism. New watchlisting information is continuously checked against the database of previously issued visas. We can and do revoke visas in circumstances where an immediate threat is recognized. We can and do revoke visas at the point that people are seeking to board an aircraft, preventing their boarding. In coordination with the National Targeting Center, we revoke visas under these circumstances almost daily. We are standardizing procedures for triggering rec revocations in the field, and we're adding revocation recommendations to the Visa Viper report. Visa Viper reports received since December contain this fuller information. At the same time, expeditious coordination with our national security partners is not to be underestimated. There have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. Although not the case here, in those circumstances, the individual was under active investigation and our revocation would have disclosed the United States government's interest in that individual and ended our law enforcement colleagues' ability to quietly pursue the case and to identify the terrorist plans and co-conspirators. We will continue to closely coordinate visa revocation processes with our intelligence and law enforcement partners while also constantly making enhancements to the security and integrity of the visa process. Information sharing and coordinated action are foundations of the border security system put in place since 9-11, and they remain sound principles. The Department has close and productive relationships with our interagency partners, particularly with the Department of Homeland Security. The State Department brings unique assets and capabilities to this partnership. Our global presence, international expertise, and highly trained and language-qualified personnel provide a singular advantage in supporting the visa function throughout the world. We developed and implemented an extensive screening process requiring personal interviews and supported by a sophisticated global information network. Our front line of border security has visa offices in virtually every country in the world and they are staffed by highly trained, multilingual, culturally aware personnel of the Department of State. We support them with the latest technology and access to information screening tools. We are introducing a new generation of visa software to more efficiently manage our growing mission and the increasing amounts of data we do handle. We are pioneers in the use of biometrics, a leader in the use of facial recognition, and we are expanding in the, into the field of iris screening. We have and will continue to automate processes to reduce the possibility of human error. The State Department makes all our visa information available to other involved agencies, giving them access to over 13 years of data. We introduced online visa applications in 2009, which expanded our data collection tenfold and provides new information that is readily available for analysis by state and other agencies, and this system will be rolled out worldwide by the end of this fiscal year. We have embraced a layered approach to border security screening, which results in multiple agencies having an opportunity to review information and require separate reviews at both the visa and admission stage. No visa is issued, no visa is issued without it being run through security checks against our partner's database. We screen applicants' fingerprints against U.S. databases 
and rerun our facial recognition software against the photo array provided by our law enforcement and intelligence colleagues as well. At the same time, we believe that U.S. interests in legitimate travel, trade promotion, and educational exchanges are not in opposition to our border security agenda. In fact, the United States must strive to meet both goals to guarantee our long-term security. Again, the multi-agency team effort to which each agency brings its particular strengths and expertise results in a more robust and secure process, a process based upon broadly shared information. We remain fully committed to correcting mistakes and remedy deficiencies that inhibit the full and timely sharing of information. We fully recognize that we are not perfect in our reporting in connection with this incident. However, we are working and will continue to work not only to address shortcomings, but to continually enhance our border security screening capabilities and the contributions we make to the interagency effort. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'd be pleased to take any questions that you and your colleagues might have. I want to sincerely thank all the witnesses and uh, ask Subcommittee Chairman Jerry Nadler to begin the questioning. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm not sure which witness I'll, I'll address the first two questions to. Uh, after the Christmas bomb plot, the President directed uh, I'm sorry, the Christmas bomb plot obviously exposed certain longstanding gaps in how we use and analyze threat information, and we're told what you're working to fix these. What are you doing to identify any other gaps, ones that weren't revealed by this plot by may, but maybe by the next plot? In other words, ones you haven't thought about yet. If, if I could, uh, Please. sir. One of the things we're doing is in the past, the State Department received a visa application, and then we ran the individual's name and other particulars against a, a 27 million count database that we received from, uh, from our colleagues and information that we have uh, developed ourselves. We have turned that into now, and we'll have by the end of this fiscal year, a completely automated process where the visa application will come in to us electronically. We are then going to push that visa application information immediately to all of our partners in the intelligence community so they can and law enforcement community, so they can look at that data in real time as we are also looking at it to see if there is information they may have in the broader uh, field sub information submitted by the applicant, not just the name, date and place of birth, passport number and other data. So our goal is to push out all the information we can to our colleagues and enable them to provide us with more and fuller information that they might have in their possession so we can make the decisions. We already reject almost two million visa applicants a year, and we want to make sure that we reject everyone who would threaten our national security. Thank you, as long as you added those last few words. Um, after the uh, Christmas bomb plot, the administration announced that travelers from 14 nations would be subjected to heightened scrutiny. Most of these 14 nations are Muslim nations. Some have said that terrorists will be able to plan their travel to avoid these countries, but innocent travelers will not. Why do you think this is not the case, and how does this really increase our national security? Some have said that this is simply religious profiling. How does this really increase our national security? I'd uh, just like to note, thank you very much, that the 14 countries, um, we do not consider the objective of the 14 countries to be a permanent list of countries. It is what was a way to have a quick mechanism in response to the immediate threat. They were compiled through a list of individual uh, countries who are currently on the list of state sponsors of terrorism, state havens, or are otherwise linked to the current threat streams that are being tracked. We do not, uh, as I noted, we at DHS is going to continue to evaluate these designations and will update them when appropriate. I think it is important to note that it is unrelated to uh, religion. It is focused on individuals who are traveling to, from, or through uh, countries where, again, we have noted that there's a safe haven, a sponsor, state sponsor of terrorism, or something uh, linked to the current threat stream. Thank you. Let me ask you a different question. Um, everything we've heard thus far is about uh, terrorism, I'm sorry, is about the information linked to visas or air travel. What about train travel within this country? What are we doing to make uh, uh, train travel safe? Uh, I take the train every week from New York to Washington and back. 
It's a great convenience that I don't have to be screened. I'm very happy about that. On the other hand, um, I could bring almost anything I wanted onto that train and no one would be the wiser. Um, thank you very much. I, we do recognize very much that aviation tends to occupy an awful lot of our attention uh, and resources. Uh, this is in part because of the continuing threat streams that we are seeing. At the same time, we very much do recognize there are threats to other modes of transportation in particular. Um, uh, Congress has directed specific legislation also around areas such as maritime ports for us to follow. Uh, these are very much a focus of ours and something we do look into very closely in terms of what are the appropriate measures to take in each of these environments to work through what is a sustainable process. Perhaps it might be appropriate to set up a follow-on conversation to talk more specifically. Well, let me just ask one further question on that since you brought it up. I was going to ask it anyway. I was, it was my next question in any event. Uh, I was the chief author of the legislation uh, three, that passed three years ago to require that every uh, container uh, be inspected and sealed before it's put on a ship bound to the United States in the foreign port, given that it would be a little late to find a nuclear device while being inspected in an American port. Um, the Bush administration, as far as I could tell, made no effort to implement that. The Obama administration, as far as I can tell, has made no effort uh, to implement that legislation. It, is, it has told us that it will not be able to do it within the time frame, although the legislation provides for waivers up to a certain point. Uh, but I, I've seen no evidence that the administration is making any attempt actually to implement that legislation. Could you tell us differently? Um, I would just like to note that we've got uh, several programs in this arena, container security initiative being a, a key one in this uh, environment where we work both with uh, the various individuals here in the United States and overseas. Excuse me, let me stop you right there. There's a fundamental difference. Uh, on the one hand, there are people in the security uh, field under both administrations who've told us that it's impractical to uh, inspect every container. We'll look at threats. We'll, we'll base, uh, this we'll inspect five or six percent of the containers based on, on threat analysis and so forth. On the other hand, Congress made the judgment that, and the President signed the bill, that that's not sufficient, that we want to inspect every container, we want to get to that capability in a reasonable period of time. So my question is, what is the administration doing to implement that determination? Um, sir, I cannot answer that uh, question to your satisfaction. Uh, as you have stated, the administration's position is that we are focusing on the risk uh, uh, procedure, and, and given the resources, we are- but Surely you're not telling us you're ignoring the congressional directive. Of course not, sir, I would not. <laughs> Uh, but you would say what? I would say that the administration is working very hard to implement in a way that it believes is risk-based and appropriate to the threat, understanding that the direction is 100 percent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry Nadler. Lamar Smith. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I actually have several questions about uh, the same subject, and I think the questions will go to Mr. Kennedy and Ms. Cogswell. And this is the uh, subject of the uh, 2,800 individuals with suspected ties to terrorism whose visas have been revoked since uh, one. I think that's around 350 a year. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, the first question is, how many of these individuals are still in the country, to your knowledge? These are the individuals with ties to terrorism whose visas we've revoked. I, I sir, I, that okay. who who is in this country or not, I'd have to defer to my colleagues at, at DHS. They, okay. they keep the records of, of individuals who are, who are not, or are okay. not in Ms. the United Coswell. States. Um, we have analyzed all those records and uh, forwarded out certain individuals to the field for investigation. If uh, possible, perhaps we could follow up with your staff for a more restricted briefing on uh, the results of that analysis. Do you, why can't you tell me now? Do you consider that to be classified information? As um, we consider the results related to um, how, the how the reviews are going to be restricted, yes. Okay. I'm not asking about how the reviews are going. I'm just wondering how many are still in the country. I cannot answer that at this time in terms – I just don't have the number with me. Can you get it from staff in the time we're in the hearing today? Um, how many of these individuals are on – have appealed their revocation of the visa? Is that a figure – a number you need to get as well? We would not have that. Okay. Who would have that? Um, Sir, uh, Mr. 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 Uh, Smith, if I could, uh, 
there is no we do, we will we would not entertain a an appeal for revocation of a visa we would just uh, we, we will not we would not reinstate once a visa is revoked it, it, it is revoked, and the individual under, under, is free to apply for a new visa. But right. after that circumstance, how, how many of these individuals then have been removed, deported? Again, sir, that's a question back, for okay, back Homeland to, Security, back to sir. DHS. Okay. Yes, Ms. Cogswell. I'm um, sorry, I was inquired. Um, oh, the other uh, question was of the individuals with suspected ties to Paris, whose visas have been revoked. How many of those individuals have actually been removed from the country? Um, I would need to follow up, sir. I am not aware at this time. We were evaluating uh, how many had stayed and then referring those for investigation. Right. Of, those of those 2,800, how many have been removed from the country? You don't know that either? Uh, it is important to note of most of those, m very few were even in the country in the first place. Okay. Uh, most of these, okay. And the ones who were in the country, you're going to give me that figure later, and then how many were removed of that figure? Um, so right now we are in the process right now, so I don't believe um, of the very small number who are still here, we have not reached that stage yet in the investigation, but I will need to, f to okay. follow up. And what are you doing to try to find these individuals and remove them? So these uh, have been forwarded out to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE agents to evaluate um, the information and go after and investigate these in conjunction with the FBI as part of a terrorism okay. uh, uh, review. Okay. And the earlier figures you can give me in the next few minutes from staff, you think? I, I will attempt to do so, okay. otherwise we'll follow up. I'm sure your staff will be able to do that. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Healy, a couple of questions uh, for you. Uh, the first is in regard to the watch list system, um, should the system be changed so that if we had the equivalent information again that we had uh, about Abdumatalib, uh, should we change the system so that that would trigger action that was not triggered this time? Or, did, or is, the, is the failure that we had the information, we just didn't have the right uh, spelling, and if we'd had the right spelling, that would have triggered action, which, which is the case? Congressman, as I mentioned, um, we're in the process of reviewing uh, the issues that occurred as a result of the Christmas Day event. Um, some of those, uh, not, not necessarily in terms of the watch listing standard, but more so in terms of the implementation and how that process works. So it's an implementation problem, not a standards problem? That's one of the things that we've taken a look at and we're leaning toward. There's there's issues, as, as you've mentioned and some of the congressmen here has men have mentioned, regarding the um, uh, ability to uh, credit uh, Dr. Mutalab when he first came in to the embassy. Um, there was specific implementation regarding sole source, and it has to be credited. You have to get uh, have to define credibility. Um, we're recommending that uh, with that particular case, we leave it up to the Counselor Affairs to assess the credibility of the source in situations like that. Based on, on, on his standing with the community, he would be deemed credible, and that would, be move, that would move up as well. Things like that we're taking a look at so you're and making to decide, recommendations. Try to decide whether it's human error or a lack of standards or standards that might be too high. We might need to adjust the standard to trigger action next time. Is that what well, that's what you're studying? I think uh, based on the President's report, they talked about the difficulty in connecting the dots. Uh, as, as my colleague um, uh, Russ has mentioned, there's a lot of noise out there. Um, this, this was a result of, we believe, a one of connecting the dots issue. As, um, a, as opposed to standards. As opposed to standards, but we're looking at the standards and we're making some adjustments or recommendations uh, for the implementation of that, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Haley, final question. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago in your testimony that you've conducted a thorough review of the terror screening database to ascertain the current visa status of all known or suspected terrorists. What are the results of that? We identified those individuals um, and referred to our state colleagues. I believe most of those have been revoked. They're under review right now. There were approximately 1,100 individuals that had received visas that were in the terror screening center database. And that information was coordinated with our Department of State colleagues. Okay, and do we and do we know where those individuals are? Have they been removed or not? I, I believe that as that gets uh, back to the same question I was asking. That's the number I've asked for. Okay, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bobby Scott, Chairman of the Subcommittee on Crime. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, just a brief question. You, we're getting all this information, some of it in foreign languages. Do we have enough foreign language people on staff to listen to some of these wiretaps? Or do we need more staff knowledgeable in foreign languages? Uh, I would just say, sir, that uh, foreign language uh, training has, has been an issue for the community about as long as I've been in that community. Uh, we've obviously spent a great deal of money uh, focused on many of the uh, difficult languages in particular, but at the same time, I, I think everyone would acknowledge that there are shortages in, in a number of, of languages. Have you asked for us to do anything in response, like more funding? more scholarships, more courses? Uh, from NCTC's perspective, no, sir. I'd have to check with uh, ODNI and the various organizations. We'd be so you recognize the shortage, and you haven't recommended that we do anything about it? Uh, it wouldn't be NCTC to make that recommendation, sir. Uh, I can check with the broader community and get back to you on what requests have been made. Okay. Um, Ms. Contrewell, if, um, if the um, Christmas bomber had been on the extra search list, would the extra search have revealed his plan? Sir, uh, when you say extra search list, can you mean the changes that we've made since December? Well, uh, you, you have a no-fly list and you have a selectee list, right? And a selectee means you get extra screening. The correct. Okay. If he had been given extra screening, could we have revealed the threat? If he had been given extra screening, there would have been a greater likelihood we would have found the threat. Uh, as has been noted, given uh, where we believe or how he was transporting the material, if, for example, it was in his carry-on baggage and his, hand, his baggage was hand-searched, it's highly likely it would have been found. Um, given if he was holding it uh, where it eventually was detonated, um, that takes a very uh, personal type of pat-down in order to find that. Um, that is something since the 25th we've been focusing very much with our foreign partners on as well, understanding how can we best find these types of threats. Would the um, that um, X-ray machine, um, the see-through thing, would that have revealed it? Um, thank you. This is an important distinction from what has been our current process under a, a traditional magnetometer and X-ray machine. It's primarily looking uh, for metal. The advanced imaging technology has the benefit in that it identifies uh, any um, foreign material uh, by the fact that it shows up as an anomalous uh, uh, object on uh, the body as a way to identify material. Uh, again, given the location, we cannot say with certainty that it would have found it, but it is a significant improvement enhancement over what we have today. Does that mean he could have gotten through anyway? In all of these circumstances, we say that they can, we can never say any specific layer and any specific technology is a 100% solution. We do also say this is why we must have the various layers, so that you would have uh, both these types of advanced technologies in order to scan, as well as things like behavior detection uh, or canines, um, so that you have the best likelihood of, uh, of identifying these threats, rather than relying on one single aspect. When we... Um started the debate on the Department of Homeland Security, the problem that we were trying to solve was the fact that the Department of Justice had information, CIA had information, Department of Defense and Department of State all had information, but they weren't talking to each other. <coughs> and our solution before people not talking to each other was to establish a fifth organization in which none of the other four landed. So now you have five people not talking to each other. Can you Explain to me how the Department of Homeland Security has actually helped things. Uh, I would like to start out by noting that the Department of Homeland Security was made up of 22 separate agencies who were originally part of that larger group. Uh, so I would say that um, while it does look like a fifth new agency, all of the components within DHS, such as Customs and Border Protection, Immigration Customs Enforcement, the Secret Service, all were very much part and parcel of this process well before uh, these events, so that it is important to understand that um, these relationships, these processes have really advanced and improved. Uh, we've streamlined many of them and very much inculcated a number of these to enhance our screening processes uh, since that time. Uh, sir, could I add something, if I might, to that? <coughs> prior to, prior to 9-11, <coughs> the State Department had a, a screening 
database that we used before we issued visa somewhere on the order of of nine or ten million hits and obviously that number is growing the last years right now sir when before we issue a visa we run that database against twenty seven million possible individuals of concern so four hundred in percent increase since nine eleven five million of those records come from the department of homeland security eleven million of those records come from the FBI others come from elsewhere in the community and we also now have the full access to the FBI's fingerprint database other material provided to us from elsewhere including homeland security when we run our full facial recognition software that's an eighty three million facial images including material received from throughout the law enforcement and intelligence community I'm not saying that we're there or it's perfect but by bringing all this information together in the sharing process that we have at least from the State Department's view we have access to an incredibly expanded and diverse database that we never had before in order to help us make our decisions. And that the Department of State didn't end up in the Department of Homeland Security, so you didn't need the Department of Homeland Security to do that. Let me let me ask another question because I'm running out of time. Um, we've talked about the issue of torture has, um, has come up, and my question is if Terry McVeigh had been caught either shortly before or shortly after the Oklahoma bombing, um, if we're going around torturing people, how would we have known whether he should have been tortured as an American citizen or not? Uh, sir, I, th I think I'd probably speak for all of us that the, that question would be way outside the lane of responsibility for any of our organization. NCTC, for instance, looks at uh, analysis and, uh, and integration of information well, but if um, if he had been captured and if he was kind of foreign looking um, there's um, people have suggested he shouldn't have been given Miranda rights and ought to have been tortured to get information are you suggesting that torture is always outside the line N no, sir. I'm just saying that that particular no, question no, wait, 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 is outside the lane of any of our organizations. Of any of your organizations, but it's not outside the lane of, Ameri of United yeah. States policy. Uh, I would refer you to Department of Justice and, and operational organizations. Uh, Mr. Healy, you're in the Department of Justice. Torture outside the uh, lanes. We need to get information. No, sir. As a uh, as a father of seven, when you talk about torture, I think about what my children would say. Um, I would not, with the word torture, condone torture. But with regard to your question, sir, I would refer you to the Department of Justice or my director. Um, so um, if you, how would you get information, how would you know whether to use, what do you call it, enhanced inter interrogation techniques? Um, how would you know whether to apply those techniques or give Miranda warnings to someone? Um, if it's an American citizen, I would assume they would be entitled to Miranda warnings. Is that right? In a law enforcement action, and I go back to my 24 years as an FBI agent, uh, in a criminal matter, if I arrest someone, as a matter of policy, prior to interrogating him, uh, I would issue Miranda warnings. Yeah, if, if, they, if they look foreign, is that? Um, I mean, Mr. I'm talking in general. Well, if they in look my foreign, law enforcement would, would, a days, would a person's right to the Miranda warning be less if they looked foreign? Again, sir. Um, the, the policy for law enforcement actions, if I have two components, custodial and interrogation, um, as part of our, our, my policy um, that I follow in any type of law enforcement case, um, it, I would Mirandize them. With regard to specific cases, 
or operational decisions, I would refer you to, if it's a, a counterterrorism case or in a particular case, I'd refer you to the assistant director over that particular case. So you would not treat someone who looked a little different than everybody else different than Terry McVeigh? Pardon me, sir? You would not treat someone who looked foreign differently than you would have treated Terry McVeigh? Does yes. A does a person who looked, yes, you would treat them no, differently? No, sir. You would treat, be treated I'm acknowledging. Um, I guess we're in the five-minute honor system. I think our five, <laughs> five minutes is up. Does the gentleman need more time? Uh, well, let me ask another question then, since we've invited the other question. With all the information we have, how do we um, limit the number of people who can see the information um, that may be embarrassing, medical, mental health uh, about people? How do we limit the number of people that have access to that information and at the same time have enough people um, connecting the dots? Uh, excellent question, sir. Um, as all of my colleagues have indicated, uh, I believe that by any objective standard, uh, every department and agency in this government is pushing more and more electrons to relevant organizations to help do this, quote unquote, connect the dots. Uh, while we do so, we are also incredibly careful about what information is being passed. And so issues of uh, privacy concerns are foremost on all of our minds. Uh, we have uh, uh, significant conversations with any organization, for instance, that has a database with commingled data, a, a database that may have U.S. persons as well as foreign individuals in that data set. Uh, how, how do we get that information? What can we do with it? How long can we keep it? Uh, we have extensive auditing to ensure that information is being properly utilized. And so we have gone to great strides to both promote um, uh, information sharing, but at the same time be good stewards of information. And confidentiality, because a lot of the information you get will certainly be um, embarrassing, uh, confidential. I mean, you're talking about medical information, mental health, family situations, a lot of things that people would just assume not be public and not have a lot of people. I mean, if you're in Northern Virginia, it's very likely that some of your neighbors and friends might be government officials. How do you limit the number of people who can actually see it and at the same time make best use of it? Just speaking from the, the intelligence and national counterterrorism perspective, uh, we would not be privy to any of that information. The only information that I get from the Federal Bureau of Investigation is related to terrorism investigations, for instance, or information that could color be associated with terrorism. And the same thing with, with Homeland Security. I'm not getting any medical records or anything like that at NCTC. And, and Congressman, if I may also point out, the way the system is set up, uh, NCTC or TIDE actually holds identifying information and the derogatory information. So they would hold that, and it's a very highly classified system. The process that we set up with the terrorist watch list was that that identifying information alone would be forwarded down to our screening partners. So the information, the detailed information that you're talking about would not be available to the state or local law enforcement officer. It wouldn't be available to the thousands of Customs Border Protection people or the Counselor Affairs. The, the way the process is set up is taking into consideration privacy, liberty, civil liberties, and things like that as well so that once it, a name goes through that process or an individual goes through that process, it gets vetted with NCTC and they push down only identifying information. Once we look at it, we push down only identifying information. So the only information that's available to a law enforcement officer is the individual that I've stopped may or may not be a known or suspected terrorist. For additional action, call the terrorist screening center and confirm that. Once that confirmation is made, a series of events occurs Again, as I spoke before, a coordination between the FBI for some type of operational response. So the whole system was set up um, to, one, allow every law enforcement officer that queries into NCIC, every border protection officer, and every Department of State person when somebody applies for a visa to have that terrorist information available to them in their existing systems, but yet balance civil liberties. And I think that we've really worked hard to strike that balance collectively with all of us. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Scott. Uh, we now uh, turn to Dan Lundgren. Excuse me, Bob Goodlatte. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate that. And, and just observation I had listening to all this, uh, <clears throat> I've often wondered why um, some people think telling someone that, quote, you have the right to remain silent uh, would make it more likely that they would talk to you. <clears throat> That's the only thing I never tried with my kids, I guess. Uh, but maybe the world works differently than my experience has been. Uh, I would also say, um, to ask someone questions without Mirandizing them is not torturing them. One of the questions previously was, do you Mirandize them or do you torture them? There's a whole world in between that. And uh, it sort of goes to some of the confusion we have here. Um, would the gentleman from Florida, would he allow me to use his uh, slide? Can, can we put that up? Uh, it helps me visually to, to be able to see exactly uh, how this information flow goes. If, I, I don't know, can you read that? Th this is a um, schematic that Mr. Rooney has that was uh, taken from some testimony by the State Department previously and uh, CRS actually put it together and it tries to show the flow of information. And the reason I ask that is um, in my opening statement, I mentioned that I had some concern about us using a different standard for watch listing. And that in the previous administration, as I understand it, the uh, standard um, was uh, appropriately suspected um, to now this new reasonab reasonable uh, suspicion standard that appears to me to come right out of Terry versus Ohio which is a criminal justice standard. And so, uh, Mr. Healy, I guess I would ask you, why has the administration decided that the Terry standard should apply uh, to aliens outside the United States who, by my understanding of the Supreme Court decisions, have no right to Fourth Amendment uh, protection? Thank you, Congressman. The um Prior to the reasonable suspicion standard that began, uh, actually it was enacted with, um, with uh, the community in February of 08, there wasn't a standard. Um, I have the unique position of being at the Terror Screening Center during those early days when we started learning how, watch, how the watch listing process was. And what occurred actually was is as we progressed through the process, we identified an issue of making a standard so that the community could agree with it. As you mentioned, Terry versus Ohio um, wasn't is a legalistic is a legalistic uh, opinion by the Supreme Court, but that that was used as a baseline to help define reasonable suspicion, and from there it was adopted and adjusted to meet the intelligence and law enforcement requirement. That process was very similar to the process that we're ongoing right now, Congressman, that involved all of the different agencies to come up with a unified standard so that they knew. The problem before that, Congressman, was is that the CIA felt an individual should have been watched as they went through the process, and it was or wasn't, and it was inconsistent. Okay, well, well here, here's my question. As I understand what you said in response to Mr. Smith's question, you indicated uh, the um, Christmas bombing uh, response as a failure to connect the dots. And I thought Mr. Travers suggested it wasn't so much a question of connect, uh, connecting the dots, but actually establishing what the dots were. And, and if I understand that correctly, there seems to be uh, uh, somewhat of a difference. And my question would be then to both of you, does the standard that has been adopted, the one that you articulated, which is the nominator, based on the totality of the circumstances, must rely on articulable intelligence or information which, taken together with rational inferences from those facts, reasonably warrant a determination 
that an individual is known or suspected to be or have been knowingly engaged in conduct constituting in preparation for, in aid of, or related to terrorism or terrorist activities. Um, does that definition help you in the case of uh, the Christmas bomber or hinder you or make no difference whatsoever? With, with the review process, that particular standard, the reasonable suspicion standard that, you, that, you, that we've identified that we've been using, right? based on the review, we feel that the, the, the reasonable suspicion standard is adequate. We've looked at some of the implementation that we use. Well, adequate for what purpose? Adequate for protecting you against uh, legal action later on or adequate for purposes of putting the people on the list who ought to be on the list? Because this is an individual who wasn't on the list. Right. With regard to the Terror Screening Center and NCTC and all of my um, colleagues here, we work with this terrorism issue every day. And it's not, it's not um, an issue of I'm concerned about being prosecuted. It's an issue of every day I sit down and talk to my staff and tell them this. If we make a mistake, people die. It's that easy. And as a result of that, we work to ensure that we don't have people get on planes and hurt people. The reasonable suspicion standard that we have, based on what occurred and based on the review, I think collectively we feel that that is a reasonable standard. It's low enough to be able to include people. It's high enough to make sure that we balance that civil liberties and protection of the American so, people. So should Mr. Uh, Abdul Batalib uh, have met the standard based on the totality of circumstances relying upon articulable intelligence or information which taken together with the rational inferences from the facts reasonably have warranted a determination that he was known or suspected to be or have been knowingly engaged in conduct constituting in preparation for or in aid of or related to terrorism or terrorist activities. And the question was, sir? The question was very simple. I asked you whether or not Mr. Abdul Muttalib meets that standard. That's my question. That's what we're here for. If, if all of the intelligence was put together, he would have met that standard in my view. Well, that's, here's my whole question. If someone is starting off with that standard, does he even begin to go into the process? Does the person at, uh, at the consulate uh, in, uh, in Kenya or, or, or Yemen or wherever, mm -hmm. if they get that information from his father, does this standard give them a reason to put him in the system or does this standard become so restrictive that if I take that information in knowing nothing else, I don't begin it to okay. put into the process? That's my question. It, actually, it does. The way the process is set up with TIDE and NCTC, and I'll let my other colleagues speak as well, and with the Terrorist Screening Center, TIDE actually has a lower standard, and it starts the process. Okay, that's what I want to know. So what should the standard have been that the State Department should have paid attention to to at least enter that bit of information with enough significance so that you would have put it into the system. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get at. We've heard a lot of stuff here, but I'm trying to get at what happens in this case if it's repeated, what standard is used at that entry point that would start it going? In the, and I think the, the complexity here, sir, is that with respect to uh, Umar Farouk, the, the information that came in from the State Department uh, on the 20th of November was everything they had with respect to derogatory. That amount of derogatory at the time, uh, as you, I think, correctly quoted, under the influence of extremists in Yemen or something along that line, would not have been sufficient to get him watch listed. The failure on the part of NCTC was there was this other piece of information that had we, in fact, uh, connected it to the, the Visa Viper cable, I think everyone agrees would have Cross the bar okay. would have gotten. Okay, my watched. question is, is very precise. I hope, okay. which is, was it the failure of the intake officer? I'll call him the intake officer. Whoever got that information from his father, mm -hmm. was it the failure of him to put significant facts into this entry point, or was it that the system didn't automatically take that bit of information and connect it with several other pieces of information? Um. The system at the time said militants, extremists, jihadists should not be nominated without particularized derogatory. 
the state department had no other information from the father that would have come to me that would have led my analyst to nominate the end ok so what's the difference now same scenario comes in today same information no more information it's not after the fact it's before the fact father comes in with that information what difference would it make that, today? And that's the discussion that's ongoing within the interagency right now, but I think that as a general proposition, uh, the quality of the source coming in would weigh quite heavily. The father. The father, exactly. And so that you could have sufficient flexibility to get a, an extremist nominated to the watch list. And, and additionally, sir, <coughs> the, the label extremist, we're taking a look at that as well and judging that, uh, again, the implementation process, judging that as well. My, my, my other question would be on this. Did when you folks got the information from State Department, did you not know the source? That is, did you not know it was his father and the, the significance of his father? Being a, a reliable source, someone who, if you look back now, and I know it's easy to look back now, you look back now, it's the father, he's got some prominence. He obviously is, is putting himself in jeopardy um, uh, by bringing this information forward or maybe bringing his son into jeopardy. That, to me, if I'm an investigator, if I'm even in law enforcement, suggests, hey, this guy might be credible. So was that information passed on to you? Um, um, I, I've, I've actually forgotten whether or not that fact was in the Visa Viper table itself. I, I don't think it was, it but, but frankly, uh, that would not have, at the time, given the standards and the way we were interpreting the standards, would not have been sufficient. Uh, the father was concerned. He frankly wasn't concerned that his son was going to go blow up an airplane. wasn't concerned well, that I know, was going to be a terrorist. But, I mean, but he was he concerned enough to come to us to tell uh, us well, there right. was a problem. Sh sure. Um, uh, but yeah. I will tell you that we get tons of data pieces uh, over the course of days and weeks about extremists and people being concerned about relatives and so forth. It's a, it's a function of separating the, the really important ones from those that are of less I understand concern. that, and I've heard this before. My question is, is it going to be different next time? Well, I realize you get all kinds of information. I realize that. that Congressman, one of the things that uh, we're, we're we've looked at and recommended changes for is that w single source coming in and the ability for that, that receipt officer to be able to judge the credibility of the source. In this case, because of the prominence of the individual, because of the fact that he's reporting on his son, that would give additional weight to the nomination process. Yeah. And that, that part of it well, is probably. My concern is this. You know this, being in the FBI for your career and, and having any exposure to law enforcement, particularly at the local level. Often it is a, a small piece of information from an investigator, from someone who's got some sense that something's wrong that triggers an entire investigation. Goodness gracious, uh, Watergate. <laughs> I, I completely you know, agree, I mean, sir. that started with somebody who put something together. Uh, you put a piece of tape on a, uh, on a door jam, and the government uh, implodes. No one would have uh, figured that. I mean, my point is we understand the significance of, a, um, of an intuition by trained people mm -hmm. in the field. And, and I just want to make sure that this standard doesn't go counter to that. That's all I'm trying to do is to make sure we are not – putting a harness on good people in the field who are beginning to sense that something's wrong and, and, and I don't want them to have this fear that, oh my God, you're going to be accused of this, that, or the other thing mm -hmm. by not entering into the system. That is my fear and that's my concern and that's all I'm trying to get to here. Sir, if I might add, when, when, the fa when the information came to the State Department, you know, we get lots and lots of poison information every day. You know former business partners, former boyfriends, former girlfriends come in all the time and attempt to, using a law enforcement term, dime out their people. The State Department took this seriously enough as we do things, and that is the entire purpose, sir, sir of the Visa Viper program. Somebody comes in and we say, this doesn't look right. We then send that information off to Washington so that our colleagues in the law enforcement and intelligence community can integrate that single piece of information, just as you said, the investigator seeing something did on it, the did scene. Did that indicate, the Viper report indicate that it was the father? There, there, was, there was. And that the father was there, prominent? There was collateral reporting that we could discuss in another venue, sir. Well, I mean, that's pretty important. Now, there, pretty, pretty doggone important. There is collateral reporting that. And, and that I appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate the entire panel. But, sir, you said. Um, 
we took it uh, seriously or seriously enough or something. Obviously, we didn't take it seriously well, enough. I was talking about the State Department taking the father's reporting to us, the sufficient severity to send it into Washington and not dismiss it as, right. you know, as raving. I, I hope the State Department has purchased the, the Yahoo software that if you have a different we, spelling, we, it works we, out. We have that already installed. <laughs> Thank you, Dan Lundgren. Sheila Jackson Lee. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me um, ask uh, Mr. Healy, um, uh, how many years have you served at the uh, Bureau? Uh, approximately 24. So you were uh, at the Bureau during the Bush administration? Yes, ma'am. And um, to your knowledge, Miranda was used uh, in previous uh, administrations on alleged terrorists. Miranda? Uh, yes, I believe uh, in, in, in previous cases uh, when individuals were arrested, they Mirandized them. Yes, ma'am. And do you feel that um, the security of the nation was diminished because Miranda was used in certain instances? I, I don't think I had a uh, opinion on it, ma'am. Would you use it? I don't see why you don't have an opinion. I don't understand that. Do you believe that the security of the nation was diminished at times that Miranda was used? For the title seems to be over the director of terrorism screening, so uh, you have some sense of terrorism. I, I don't know what you mean you don't have an opinion. Does, does Miranda equal a diminishment of security for the United States? If it is used, I, I don't think it's a factor. I've right. never, I've never seen it used where it's a factor in in that, ma'am. And where it, it is a factor in that it can be considered a problem in the security of America. Is that my understanding? Uh, again, with my with my experience in criminal matters, I've not worked um, terrorism cases other than my involvement six years ago with the shift in the the direction of the bureau. Um, whether a Miranda warning was issued or not is an operational decision that is made at the time. And so you would not uh, oppose operational decisions like that if the parties involved felt that Miranda was appropriate? I, I would refer to decisions like that to the operational components on the ground and uh, my superiors. A as the director of the Terror Screening Center, um, with regard to this particular case, my involvement didn't involve the operational component. It was already ongoing. The only time that my involvement with the terror screening center and any type of terrorist subjects that are watch listed, the operational component is during the screening process. And my, the extent of my involvement in that is to coordinate with the FBI to get the operational components on the ground connected with the screening entities. Once that's occurred, then they take over the investigation or whatever come results of that. As a result I'll of that, the they question. report. I'll pose the question to others on the panel, see whether they have an answer. But let me continue to, to work with you uh, on this question of uh, particularly the uh, Christmas Day uh, bomber. Uh, what was the breakdown between the uh, information received in Nigeria uh, with the State Department? The State Department is here, I know in uh, getting this, inform this information transferred and interpreted such that uh, this alleged perpetrator could be on the watch list? The, the initial information, as my colleagues have said, um, based on the father coming into the embassy resulted in a visa viper. That visa vi viper was re referred to, to NCTC and entered into TIDE. Um, that visa viper, as, I, as, as uh, Mr. Travers has said, um, had enough biographical information to be in TIDE or watch listed, lacked enough derogatory information to put it into the reasonable suspicion standard. So from that standpoint, um, the name wasn't watch listed based on that single reporting piece of intelligence, and it wasn't pushed over to the terror screening center database. So where do you think the collapse came or the failure came? 
as I have said, if we have a magic ball, I mean, if there was if there was something that would allow us to connect the dots on everything, every piece of, in, of an intelligence that came in, and it it automatically connected to everything else that we had, that would be very beneficial. If you could look at the totality of the facts uh, to be able to to make a nomination, that would be helpful. Unfortunately, um, right now, what we get from NCTC is between 400 and 1,200 add, modi modifies, and deletes a day. What they look at is significantly bigger than that. Do we need more resources, more trained uh, uh, professionals in human intelligence? Because uh, let me uh, try to, um, without uh, probing into classified information, I, I assume that the father publicly told the point person in Nigeria that the individual had been to Yemen and that he had felt that he was being trained in Yemen. Was that not information that the desk officer had? I, I'd have to refer to the desk officer on that, ma'am. I'm not sure. So you didn't have, um, you don't have, you're not privy to what information was then sent through Visa Viper and then on to the various areas? W the way the process works, the information, the derogatory information is in TIDE, and, and I'll refer to my colleague to, to talk about the TIDE information. All right, colleague, would you answer that, please? Yeah. Travis, sure. Thank you. Uh, the, the Visa Viper cable that came in, Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, uh, came into one of my desk analysts with the, the Viper cable that had a, a, um, a pretty short statement of derogatory under the influence of extremists in Yemen or something to that effect. Uh, what she did was exactly what, what she's been taught. Uh, she went and searched Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib across all the other databases and got exactly zero hits. Why? Because there was no other Abdul Muttalib anywhere in the database. The problem came that there was other information out there associated with an Umar Farouk, that's all, spelled differently. And the challenge for her, the challenge for all of my analysts is that Roughly 350 names are nominated to the National Counterterrorism Center every day, and they span a wide range of derogatory information, suicide bomber, uh, facilitator of terrorism, extremist. In the case of Umar Farouk Abdul Muttalib, he would have been at the very, very low end of our level of concern. And that's why in my opening statement, I said the two things that we're trying to do to enhance our ability to catch the next one of these kinds would be to uh, bolster the resource base associated with populating TIDE so that instead of a relatively rudimentary data set, we're enhancing the record so that the analysts will go out and search for other information that might enhance the record so that we would cross that reasonable suspicion bar to push the information to Director Feely. Similarly, we have a, a pretty substantial organization that is being built within our director for intelligence to help us with these random dots. Uh, it may not be a name, it may be a concept, but, but these are the kinds of things that are designed to help us exploit the tremendous amount of information that is out there. Are there resource implications? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Uh, let me just um, quickly move to um, Mr. Um, Kennedy of the State Department. Have you had any change in procedure based upon what happened in Nigeria? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, Congresswoman, what we have done is we have increased the uh, the information that we put into the Visa Viper re re uh, reporting cable. We we re now re the, uh, there was an interagency agreed process that we provide the following data points. What about training of your staff? Because I'm still um, concerned that the staff in Nigeria, and obviously they are not uh, terrorist uh, uh, experts, but I think if someone indicates that I believe my son is being trained in Yemen, that it should raise the level that maybe you, rather than you input it, you get on the phone and call, and maybe your call could convince the other receivers of information to heighten their sensitivity to the information. Uh, Congresswoman, we have, added, we have added additional information, but just as a matter of technicality, by, s by turning this into a Visa Viper cable and reporting it, this information goes to the entire intelligence and law enforcement community. It's like a, a, a broadcast. Calling one person is good, but we might call the wrong person, and that person may not have the – so we prefer, as a matter of course, to send it to the entire law enforcement and intelligence community so that if anyone is aware 
of concerns about this individual. We are raising the flag throughout that entire community rather than just with one individual who may or may not have, have that next piece that Mr. Lungan referred to. We're the, we're the front line, we're out there. Uh, let me yes. just finish on my question so that I can yes, yield back. Um, can you tell me uh, what determination brings about the 14 country list? Did that come after the Christmas Day bomber? There's a pa 14 country list that Pakistan is on. Um, that, is a, that is a list that was proposed by the, the, the Department so of Homeland Security. Let me move to the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security. Security. Would you explain that list and why, please? Yes, ma'am. Um, immediately. Thank you, sir. Immediately after the event, uh, DHS moved to put in place uh, immediate enhancements to our security and screening posture in order to address the immediate threat stream. Uh, in doing so, we looked at it, some a process we already had in place, the ability to issue those security directives and enhance uh, uh, emergency amendments to increase the level of screening. And we focused on uh, a way to designate um, uh, certain individuals for that enhanced screening. We selected the countries based on those that were designated as uh, state sponsors of terrorism, safe havens, or links to the current threat streams that were in the environment. These were meant to be not permanent, but near term to address the threat. They will evolve, they will change, um, and DHS- When did you establish the list? When did you establish the list? Um, I would have to check the date, but it was in a couple days, I think it's like three days after the Can event. Can you, I ask uh, that you submit the full list to the committee and the analysis uh, uh, short of being uh, classified, I assume, the general analysis that you utilize. Do you have a recollection of some of them without the whole list? I know you can recite the whole list. I, I, other than remembering, of course, that Nigeria and Yemen are on the list, I cannot recall the full list. Well, would you provide us with that list, Absolutely. please? Um, does anyone have any comment about, it seems that uh, my good friend from California was diminishing the Miranda as a basis of getting information. Um, I don't know why Mr. Healy, I guess he's limiting himself to the terrorists, but I know that he was an FBI agent uh, previous to that, and I'm not sure why he's not able to give some sense of whether or not the Miranda would diminish uh, the uh, rights uh, or the ability to secure America. But I would uh, suggest that the problem that we have, and I'm prepared to yield back, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for this hearing, and I sit on the Homeland Security Committee, is the unfortunate um, sense that I get is that we're repeating uh, post 9-11. It was the same lack of transfer of information that did not transfer a memo from an agent in the Midwest uh, to the understanding of individuals who were training and, be, and used cash to be trained in Florida to take off and not land. Uh, and so I don't know where we're going to go with this uh, sharing of information. Uh, we, we put more layers on, Mr. Chairman, but I don't know if the layers are more effective. I think it will be interesting for us to continue to pursue this and collaborate with other committees because our responsibility on securing the nation is based on, I believe, human intelligence and the transfer of such. And as I listen to Mr. Healy talk about from Visa Viper to so many acronyms, I don't know where you get to the point where somebody stops and says, this is enough for me to pick up the telephone, it's something that we don't use anymore because we're too busy emailing and people are too busy not reading their email. Uh, pick up the telephone and say, I may be in error, but let's move forward and put Mr. X, Miss X, Y, Z mm. on this watch list. I believe privacy is crucial, uh, and I don't think we should do this willy-nilly. And I'll be meeting with a group who are very concerned about the terrorists, about the list that DHS has put on, and I'm concerned about that list because I don't think it was done with thoroughness. But the point is, is that we've got to find some way to be more keen on how we transfer information to avoid Fort Hood, devastating loss of life and to avoid what could have been another devastating loss of life. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the bells are not working, but the, the voting has commenced on the floor. We will stand in recess until four votes are disposed of, and then we will resume. Committee stands in recess.